Hello and welcome to the Total Soccer Show. I am Taylor Rockwell. Daryl Grove is not with me today, but he is northbound on Interstate 95, so barring incident, he should be back in studio tomorrow. So instead, I called the other side of the country to speak with Wendy Thomas. She's a co-host of the Corner of the Galaxy podcast, and she's also a regular contributor over at American Soccer Now. We discussed the fairly turbulent offseason for the LA Galaxy, their potential DP signings, and the future rivalry with LAFC. We also talked a lot about Bruce Arena and Wendy's thoughts on him, her expectations for him as a national team manager. Uh, but before we get to that conversation, I wanted to first say that today's show is brought to you by Roughneck Scarves. That's R-U-F-F-N-E-C-K scarves.com. They They're the official scarf providers for U.S. Soccer, MLS, USL, and the NCAA. Uh, That means if you're a Galaxy supporter like Wendy, they've got you covered. If you support one of the other 21, soon to be 22 clubs in the league, which I believe is statistically more likely, then they've got you covered as well. Uh, Best of all, our listeners can get 20% off any scarf in the shop by using the promo code TOTALSOCCERSHOW at checkout. That's roughneckscarves.com, TOTALSOCCERSHOW at checkout, 20% off. And with all that said, here's my interview with Wendy. Joining me now, I've got Wendy Thomas, contributor for American Soccer Now and co-host of uh, Corner of the Galaxy podcast. Wendy, thank you very much for joining me on this uh, rainy Sunday evening where you are and rainy Sunday evening where I am. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, so a, a transcontinental, I guess, uh, or trans, con- yeah, country, I don't know, whatever it is, uh, conversation to discuss the LA Galaxy, uh, a team I know you're very much familiar with. How did you first get into supporting the LA Galaxy? How did you get into writing about them and talking about them? Well, I live in Los Angeles. That'll do it. That'll do (laughs) it. The the really short answer is that I live in Los Angeles, but I I played soccer when I was younger, when I was a kid, and I remember being a fan, but more of the women's game Mm -hmm. in the late 90s. I remember watching the USA-China game. Um, That was a memorable moment for me, but then I got reintroduced into soccer and developed a new passion for it uh, after the 2010 World Cup when Landon Donovan scored that Mm -hmm. goal against Algeria. And it was at that time when I just started thinking, oh, well, there's a local team. I should check it out. And Landon plays for them. So Mm -hmm. that's how I got back into it. And I started on the podcast about a year and a half ago. Um, I was writing for the site and Josh uh, just sort of, he tries to triage his co-host, I think. He doesn't want (laughs) to burden anyone too much. And so he just said, you know, you're writing for the site and your articles are good. Why don't you, you know, come on and Mm -hmm. say, you know, he liked what I had to offer. And so he said, well, why don't you just be a co-host? Well, there we are. And I'm glad you are so that you can keep us informed of all things LA Galaxy because it's been kind of a crazy off season. Uh, I know you guys have had lots of different people on the podcast. I listened to uh, Josh's interview with Chris Klein on the Corner of the Galaxy podcast, and I was really surprised to hear him say that they started the LA Galaxy's coaching search at halftime of the USA's loss to Costa Rica. So (laughs) basically the assumption there being that they were going to lose Bruce Arena to the national team. Had that been like a specter that was looming over the club? Did you all think that that might be a possibility, or were you surprised when it was Arena uh, and when Klinsman uh, got the X? So I was not surprised. Mm -hmm. I actually... um had spoken to someone who is in the media room at the LA Galaxy, and they said that even before the end of the LA Galaxy season, this would have been in late summer, that um, there was a contingency plan in place in the event that Bruce had to leave or something like that. I mean, they said, you know, we think that Bruce could be called upon to be the U.S. men's you know, national team coach. And I was like, really? Are you think Klinsman's going to get fired? And they're like, yeah, we think maybe, you know, depending on how these results come. And, yeah. you know, they didn't go too well. So I wasn't surprised. I, I knew the moment that Klinsman was fired, I was like, damn, darn, he, he is going <laughs> to, that means, that means that the LA Galaxy is going to be thrown into chaos, you know? So I, I did have a feeling that it was coming. And actually, before we get into what that means for the Galaxy, I know that you had written, uh, and forgive me, me, I forget the title of the article, but you'd written an article sort of, not necessarily in defense of Klinsman, but sort of spelling out... There it is. Yeah, Yeah. which he himself uh, read and enjoyed, it seems, based on his Twitter uh, Twitter correspondence. Uh, So what were your feelings when Klinsman uh, was fired by the U.S. national team? Were you surprised? Were you okay with it? Were you saddened by the move? No, I was uh, was fine with it. Um, I wasn't saddened by it. I was not surprised by it. Um, the, you know, the genesis of that article is because I had uh, a feeling that I I really liked the fact that Klinsman was initially brought in as the U.S. men's national team coach because Mm -hmm. I saw him as a disruptor of a system that I think is pretty insular, and that's the world of U.S. soccer. Um, And I thought that he could bring in some interesting ideas, and ultimately I do think that he did that. Mm -hmm. I think that 
the, he started the ball rolling on a lot of things, or maybe just he, I think that a lot of people within the world of us soccer are under the thumb in one way or another of MLS. Mm -hmm. And I think that Jurgen's background and his experience made him a bit more of an independent voice. And I like the idea of adding opinions and adding different voices into the world of U.S. soccer so that no one person or theory or philosophy predominates. But that being said, he obviously, I mean, even my article pointed out he has a number of drawbacks as a coach. Mm -hmm. And um, those drawbacks made themselves clear in terms of the results that we were getting, particularly against those last few games. So I'm not surprised. And I was fine that he was fired. I think, I hope that Bruce Arena's sojourn with the U.S. men's national team is not a lengthy one. Um, I, you know, I know you guys have done a podcast about it. Mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of him going past 2018, but I think as a pragmatic approach to getting us into the World Cup, mm -hmm. um, it's reasonable. Fair enough. And so Bruce Arena has left the LA Galaxy. Kurt Anolfo has been brought in. What are your expectations of Kurt Anolfo? Are you excited by that appointment? Do you think Galaxy fans like what they're seeing? Or is there some uh, some concern from the fans uh, with the appointment of Anolfo? There is some concern with fans about his appointment. Mm -hmm. I, I would preface this by saying that I freely acknowledge LA Galaxy fans are probably the most entitled in MLS. Um, I don't expect any MLS fans <laughs> listening have any sympathy whatsoever for any LA Galaxy fan because LA Galaxy fans have become, been accustomed to a certain level of success and anything that falls short of that is really seen as a failure. Mm -hmm. And so I'm fully cognizant of the fact that we are in some ways an unreasonable bunch. That being said, I think that there are a lot of fans um, of Bruce Arena, there are a lot of concerns with the appointment of Kurt Anolfo, but if I could play devil's advocate, you know, one of the reasons why fans are concerned is because, but for better or worse, Bruce Arena was um, the one uh, real authority within the LA Galaxy organization for the past eight years. I, there's no one, not Chris Klein, um, who None of the front office officials other than Phil Anschultz and Dan Beckerman, maybe, um, who over could override Bruce's authority. And so when people are concerned, I think it's more out of a sense of no one really knows what's coming. Mm -hmm. Because when people say, like, you know, well, what what kind of style is Curtin Alfa going to bring based on what he did with Los Dos? Or what is Chris Klein going to do for the organization based on what he has done since becoming president? And the truth is that every aspect of the LA Galaxy organization was heavily influenced by Bruce Arena. Mm -hmm. So no one knows. There's no one, I don't believe anyone who follows the Galaxy uh, could tell you with any legitimacy that they know what's going to happen because Bruce's influence was so powerful that it's a bit of, um, it's a bit of a, you're left with sort of a bit of a void with respect to, you don't really know what's going to happen. I know based on the decisions that have been made in the off season, I can speculate if those are the indicia of what's to come, but no one really knows. Well, let's talk about that for a second then, because I, I find that really surprising given how much change there's been within that Galaxy roster. Obviously, Steven Gerrard, Robbie Keane gone, Mike McGee retired, Alan Gordon uh, leaving, I believe, as of today. Yes. Uh, AJ De La Garza obviously being traded last week, or, or I guess being allowed to, or being sold, I guess it was, for what, uh, Tam and Gam or whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It, so that's is surprising to me then, because that seems like it would point to there is a plan, we do have an idea for what we want to do, and that's why we are having this kind of roster churn. So do you think it's a matter of there is a plan in place and it's coming from Chris Klein. Do you think that there's kind of consideration from all parties there? Or how do you see this roster being constructed? Well, the explicit announcement that mm -hmm. accompanied uh, Kurt Anolfo's appointment was that they fully intended to get younger. Mm -hmm. um, it would have been really, really hard to get older. I would say that. <laughs> um, but it is true that a lot of the age of the LA Galaxy's roster has been knocked out. Mm -hmm. Alan Gordon is gone. Steven Jarrett is gone. Robbie Keane is gone. And it does seem like there is a concerted effort on the part of the LA Galaxy to not uh, repeat or replicate some of the patterns that they had previously engaged in, including specifically bringing in European players in their mid-30s who are, um, whether it is fair or not fair, 
perceived as coming to the LA Galaxy to pick up a final paycheck. Mm. Um, the, the recent signing that they made was from a player who is in the first division in Portugal named Jao Pedro. Yeah. And he's someone who is sort of off the radar, I would say, for certainly of people, most people who follow MLS is their mm -hmm. predominant league of choice. I mean, I follow a good amount of the EPL and the Bundesliga. I do not follow the Portuguese league, but it makes sense to me that if they're really trying to alter the trajectory of the LA Galaxy to go younger, that they would be looking at more unknown players in more obscure leagues. Um, so it's that I think is consistent with their mm. announcement. That being said, on the very same day they made that announcement, they traded for the rights to Jermaine Jones, yep. who is a 35-year-old <laughs> central midfielder who tore his ACL last year, who played in nine games for Colorado. Um, and, you know, Colorado probably pretty rationally decided he's not worth $600,000. And so, you know, a lot of people were very concerned about the fact that, according to Jeff Carlisle, he was picked up for something like $550,000. That's a very minimal drop off, given the fact that he played in nine games last year and got injured mm -hmm. and is a year older than he was last year. It it doesn't seem to follow from logic, that decision making. So I think there's some concern on the part of LA Galaxy fans that that decision making was, you know, is emanating from this front office since we don't we don't really know a lot about their judgment um and some of the things that i you know you do know you're you know you're a little queasy about what what makes you what makes you queasy um i mean i, I want to be fair uh mm -hmm. so one of the things they announced for example um, and that they actually promoted on their Twitter account was that everyone who's now in charge of the LA Galaxy front office, that's specifically Chris Klein, Kurt Anolfo, and Pete Vienas, mm -hmm. all at one point played within the LA Galaxy organization and, you know, very mm -hmm. have really, really strong ties to LA, LA Galaxy. I think uh, from their perspective, I think what they're trying to demonstrate is that they're trying to foster a unanimity of vision. You know, they're trying to project that, we are an organization that has a really cohesive focus and everyone we're going to bring in has the same perspective and background and philosophies. And that mm -hmm. that is going to create, um, uh, you know, give the galaxy a really distinct voice and philosophy within MLS. That's one way to view it. Um, okay. But it reminds me, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, that old saying, a patient goes to a doctor and says, I have a problem. Um, well, a psychiatrist says, I think it's a psychiatric problem. Mm -hmm. An immunologist says, I think it's an autoimmune problem. A hematologist says, I think it's a blood problem. And one problem, I think, with having three people who have the same background, who are all former athletes, uh, who do have essentially the same views and perspectives and opinions on things, is that it creates um, an echo chamber where mm -hmm. everyone is echoing the same viewpoint on a decision. And I think... That, that that is not the type of um, leadership which fosters a thriving business mm -hmm. um, because it can be it, you can you can make some short sighted decisions when it's just, you know, three guys saying what we're doing is right. Right. Yeah. What we're doing is great. Don't you think what we're doing is great? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're doing really, really good. So, I mean, it, it's, it's sort of like with Klinsman. I like the idea of bringing in voices, people with different backgrounds, mm -hmm. bringing in someone with a very different background who will disagree and, you know, try and, you know, elaborate and change people's perspectives. Because like with Jermaine Jones, I mean, or even with AJ De La Garza, the, I think that you could look at the AJ De La Garza trade. And if, you know, the three of them are together and they're saying, listen, we think there is a marginal soccer advantage to trading AJ and getting Jermaine Jones. Now, I disagree with that, but I, I think that, you know, since they're soccer people, they see it naturally as a soccer decision. And it is a soccer decision, but it's also a business decision and it's also a public relations decision. And so to the extent that they fall back just like the rheumatologist, the immunologist, and the psychologist does. Just they fall back on their experience to inform their decision making. Um, but that experience, since it's also similar between them, could be something that limits the LA Galaxy going forward as much as it enhances yeah, them. That makes sense. And with that in mind, and with what you said previously, uh, so that last year's roster, I think by Chris Klein's admission, was built to win the playoffs last year. 
So there is going to be a lot of change as a result. But how much pressure do you think the team is under immediately, or at least in terms of this coming season, with the departure of Bruce Arena and those names that have left? Do you think it will be seen as sort of a time to rebuild and get younger, or do you think it's still going to be an attempt to be competitive immediately, given that it is the LA Galaxy? I think they're going to do both. I think they're making a concerted effort to get younger. Mm -hmm. I know they are. If you look at the roster right now, the forwards who are going to be playing for the LA Galaxy are Jesse Zardes, Jack McBean, Ariel Lasseter, Giovanni Dos Santos. Those are all very young players. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the rest of the team, with the exception of Jermaine Jones, is also going to be very young. It's potential we might field only two players over the age of 30 on the entire team. Um, no, three. But I mean, given that it's the LA Galaxy... And given how entitled LA Galaxy fans are, I know that Kurt Anolfo is not going to have a long leash. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you remember, Rude Hulett, who had coached for Chelsea, he had co coached for huge EPL teams, came in to the LA Galaxy and was there for eight months. And he was an internationally renowned coach. But by August, he was fired. Mm -hmm. And you know, that was someone who had received the sanction of David Beckham, who yeah. essentially had the run of the team. So, you know, I don't think that anyone is going to have a long leash in terms of being allowed to fail for a long time um, just because it's the LA Galaxy. He'll get at least as long as Rude did. But, <laughs> That's good. But, but if the LA Galaxy are terrible, I mm. mean, if it's just like a fireball at T going at terminal velocity towards the StubHub Center. And, you know, that is, we are just epically awful. Given the fact that LAFC is right around the corner, yeah. ownership is going to really want us to at least demonstrate that we have the ability to go deep into the playoffs. Yeah, I want to actually, that was my next question was about LAFC because they are, you know, preparing to come into the league the Galaxy right now have the kind of luxury of having a season where they can kind of do what they need to to get themselves in the right position. But Los Angeles is an extremely attractive destination. LAFC obviously has the backing of, what, every celebrity in Hollywood, I believe. So, <laughs> they got a group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, how much pressure do you think there is on the Galaxy right now to kind of stay at the forefront of Major League Soccer to stay as the most attractive soccer destination when it comes to Los Angeles? Well, I, I think that they're under huge pressure, but... I, it's somewhat by virtue of the fact that um, the LA Galaxy is not a perfectly run organization, and I think that there's a lot of room for improvement within the organization. Um, they definitely have done a lot of things right. I don't want to be short-sighted and not give them credit for the things that they've done. They started a girls' academy in the last year. I mean, LA was the first team to do introduce a USL team, um, Los Dos, which was one of the things that caused other teams to do similarly. Mm -hmm. I think there's huge pressure on them. And more than that, you know, one thing I really liked about Bruce Arena being the coach of the LA Galaxy is that he had a lot of ambition with respect to what he wanted to do with the league. He fought with Don Garber. He fought with um, the league officials all the time about changing things, doing things differently. And he is the type of person who would go to Phil Anschultz and say, you know what I want to do? I want to start an entire reserve team in a lower division league, and that'll be our backup. We'll then feed our academy through them, you know, and then they'll be able to transition through to the first team. Because he did that, every other team in MLS then says, well, we have to do this now, which, you know, forces conservative ownership groups to open their pocketbooks. And it pushes the league forward. Mm -hmm. one, one thing that makes me sad about him leaving is that I want other teams in MLS to continue that. I want there to be other teams pushing league ownership forward, pushing Don Garber forward, you know, not settling and conceding territory when it comes to what MLS can be. So, you know, that in some ways also makes me sad because I want to know that the LA Galaxy is still capable of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that, we, you know, we have a lot of really vocal fans. I think that they are going to be harping on ownership and they're going to be harping on the front office. You know, why are we doing this? You guys have to do better. That's one thing I do like about LA Galaxy fans in a way is that they are so demanding that it's, you know, it's a pretty high pressure position to be coaching, mm -hmm. you know, what some would say is the flagship team of MLS. 
I, I want to get to what the fans might be harping on or about in just a second, but I had one more question for you. I'm not very familiar with like the demographics of Los Angeles. I understand traffic there is uh, the worst thing <laughs> in the world. But uh, in terms of the fan base that's there and like present in the city, how – like. The Galaxy obviously have a very, you know, long-built fan base. What do you expect for the people supporting LAFC? Is that going to be people who used to support Chivas? Do you think it's going to be people who are getting into the game but maybe don't want to be seen as bandwagon fans? Or what um, are you expecting in terms of who will support the new club coming in? So it's very it's very easy for clubs to have um, tall ambitions. Mm-hmm. But one thing I would give to LF, LAFC is, if you know the geography of Los Angeles, the Exposition Center, which is where they're – uh, their stadium is going to be situated is in a fantastic location for easy access within the city. Mm. Um, the downtown of Los Angeles is very congested, but the exposition, which is accessible by light rail, um, is really, really close. So one thing that per- is prohibitive with respect to the LA Galaxy is that the location of the stadium is in Carson, mm-hmm. which is more of a, it's not suburban, but it's a little bit further south of at the LA city itself. Now, that being said, Los Angeles is a megalopolis. It essentially spreads out for hundreds and hundreds of miles. It's just huge if you mm-hmm. include the Imperial Empire, essentially all the way down to San Diego. But one thing that LAFC is going to have is there's a really dense urban population. It's closer to East Los Angeles. Um, it's closer to a lot of cities that have um, really a uh, high percent of the a population being uh, Latino um, uh, of Mexican descent. And to give you some information about LA Galaxy, uh, Los Angeles demographics, um, it's uh, hugely Hispanic. There's a huge Hispanic influence, Mm -hmm. Um, so much so that MLS is not the most watched league in Los Angeles. Liga MX is. Mm -hmm. It's it's hugely popular. So there's going to be probably a more uh, Latino fan base, uh, maybe, although there's a huge Latino fan base for the LA Galaxy. But it's a lot of it is going to be situated around the fact that it's easily accessible. You know, anyone who is um, in Pasadena, and anyone who's in East LA, it's going to be a lot easier to go to the Exposition Center than it is to be to go to Carson. And the population of Los Angeles is such that, I mean, people, there are some people who are concerned about Los Angeles supporting two MLS clubs. And I was like, really? I mean, there's like 15 million people. And <laughs> like, if yeah. you include, if you include the exterior exurbs and everything, Los Angeles could probably support, you know, 10, 15, I don't know how many teams, yeah. but a lot. I'm not concerned about the population being able to support two teams. Yeah. Nor, nor am I. I think it's maybe unfair to judge the city based on the ownership of uh, Chivas USA. I think that might be slightly, yeah. slightly unfair because it seems like LAFC have uh, some a decent footing, and uh, the Galaxy obviously do as well. Uh, the Galaxy are going to be hoping to retain that, I'm assuming, by maybe signing some more players and getting that roster settled as quickly as they can. So what are your expectations there in terms of the names coming in and when they might come in? Uh, because I saw, sorry to rattle on, but the final thing was uh, I saw, I guess, that Yel Van Dam has been given a designated player status until mid-season, where he's then getting paid down, which I'm yes. guessing points to a mid-season edition that's already being planned. Correct. So, yeah. So the LA Galaxy, as you said, there's a lot of roster churn. A lot of old names are gone. Mm -hmm. Even with the addition of Jermaine Jones and Joao Pedro, um, and also they promoted Hugh uh, Hugh Arellano, who plays Mm -hmm. for the U.S. U-20s. You've probably heard of him. I have. Uh, From from, uh, the academy, from Los Dos. I believe he's in Um, the scouting network. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe he's been promoted to the first team. So even with the addition of those players, there's still a lot of empty roster slots. Mm-hmm. I would say five or six. I mean, really, there's there's plenty of space. One of those is going to be a designated player who is going to be signed before the beginning of the season. One slot will be saved for midseason for the final designated player signing. And you're correct. Jill Van Dam is going to start. He's going to start as a DP at the beginning of the season, and then they're going to tam him down midseason because there's going to be the third DP is going to come midsummer. And that name is Jonathan DeSantos? Um, there's speculation that it's Jonathan DeSantos. <laughs> um, it wouldn't surprise me if it's Jonathan DeSantos. At this time, um, uh, his price tag from the team was uh, at $20 million, which is nowhere close to what they would actually pay. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure as his contract gets closer to expiration, um, Villarreal is going to come down. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me because I know that 
Giovanni Dos Santos, since he's come to Los Angeles, has really enjoyed living here and playing here. He really, really likes it. He's so happy. And I think he probably tells Jonathan about it. And I, they're very close, the two of them. They would probably love to be in the same city. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me. But that being said, I think we're going to sign a DP midfielder before the season starts. Mm-hmm. And at that point, our midfield would be one DP midfielder, I think probably a winger, um, Joao Pedro, Jermaine Jones, Sebastian Legette, Emma Boateng. Then we're going to have a pretty... You know, pretty full midfield, so yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, so with Jonathan DeSantos for a second, in terms of like his name recognition, do you think he has the name brand in L.A. to kind of satisfy that big player requirement? I mean, obviously not quite at the level of, say, Steven Gerrard or Robbie Keane, but still a big name. Or do you think that there will be pressure on the ownership and on the, the GM to make a big signing, a big name splash that will kind of turn some heads? Well, I think that one thing that's very appealing about Jonathan Dos Santos is that he uh, is an L3 player at mm-hmm. times. Um, so is Giovanni Dos Santos at times. And again, one thing that it wouldn't surprise me um, is if LAFC and Los Angeles Galaxy at times maybe compete with one another a little bit to make uh, signings of players who play for L3 because there's definitely a cachet and there's certainly a monetary value to a team capitalizing on the Mexican fan base in Los Angeles. So, of course, that being said, we already have Giovanni Dos Santos, so one could say you've already probably exploited the advantage that you're going to get from the public by having an L tree player. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I don't think that LA galaxy fans need a player of the likes of Steven Gerrard, particularly since, um, you know, on balance, his performance was probably a disappointment. Mm -hmm. So do you expect then people to rally around names like Joe Pedro? I don't really, as you said, it's kind of difficult to know much about him since he is what a 23 year old Portuguese midfielder. <laughs> I'm not even sure where he'll be playing. Uh, do you expect him to be defensive central? Midfield. Okay, defensive, defensive midfield. There we are. Um, and yeah. from, from what you've heard of him, what are your expectations for him with this Galaxy team? And do you, do you know does he speak much English at present? Because I'm assuming <laughs> most 23, 23 year old Portuguese midfielders do not. Um, I think he's actually Brazilian and he plays in Portugal. Ah, there we go. Okay, that but, helps. But um, uh, I don't know whether he speaks English. But what I would say is that I, of all the decisions that were made in the off season, I've been extremely critical of some. Mm-hmm. But this one I would actually um, be okay with because this is actually consistent with what the you know front office announced which was when Bruce left, they said, we are going younger. Mm -hmm. We are not going to sign any players in their mid-30s again. And I know part of that um, emanates from ownership itself, which was, you know, at the during much of last season, the Los Angeles Galaxy had $10 million sitting on its bench. And ultimately, ownership, I think, was justifiably frustrated by the fact that there was so little value for what their dollars were, Mm -hmm. you know, showing up in the field. So I think there's no way you're going to see a player in their mid-30s coming to the LA Galaxy for a big DP signing. I think they're definitely trying to go younger. If that means going to some of the sort of mid-table leagues in Europe, I actually am fine with that because I think there's a lot of quality in those leagues, and I'm not a league snob. I don't. I think that, you know, Jel Van Dam would play it at Standard Liège and the, uh, you know, Belgian Pro League. Um, and there's a lot of young, interesting talent to be found all over the world. And I think, you know, capturing a player at the beginning of their career as opposed to the end, you're more likely to find someone who is, um, you know, has a lot of ambition for themselves and what they want to establish, what they want to show mm-hmm. the fans, you know, how they want to ex- maximize their abilities. So I actually am I'm really excited about it. There may be you know, some LA Galaxy fans who would prefer to have a big name signing for my money, I would much prefer to get an unknown player who is genuinely enthusiastic about coming to the LA Galaxy and wearing the shirt than, I, you know, getting a name player, getting, you know, Zlatan, getting Wayne Rooney, who's just coming in really to, you know, increase their market value in, in the U.S. Speaking of players at the beginning of their career, uh, how excited are you that the Galaxy exercised the option on Ashley Cole? Uh, he would be one of the older uh, statesmen of the <laughs> LA Galaxy. But, you know, very diplomatic of you. Well done. 
<laughs> I am going to, I, you know, I ate my words when Ashley Cole came to LA Galaxy. When they signed him, I was really opposed to it because he had been so critical of MLS that I was convinced that he was coming and he wasn't going to, you know, make mm -hmm. a good faith effort to really put it all on the field. I was completely wrong. He actually is a really talented left back. He plays very hard. Um, he played tons of games last season. I mean, I know Robbie Keane and Steven Gerrard sat on the bench a lot. Ashley Cole played pretty much every single game. And so there's one year left on his contract. He probably has another year in him. So, and if he has, he really honestly is unbelievably good. So I'm fine with it. All right. So you're fine with that. Um, I, so then in terms of the moves that have happened, it could be promotions from Los Dos. It could be new signings, whatever you want to go with. What's one move that you've been the most impressed by or excited by? And what's one that you've had some uh, concern about, the most concern about, I would say? So the move that I've had the most concern about was trading AJ De La Garza. Mm -hmm. Um, the reasons for that are manifold, but some of the really obvious reasons are that, um, AJ De La Garza is one of the first players that Bruce brought in in 2008. As you know, he, one of the first things he did in the 2009 super draft is he drafted two kids from the university of Maryland named Omar Gonzalez mm -hmm. and AJ De La Garza. Yep. And AJ's played with the LA galaxy for eight years. He is many fans, favorite player. And that's when I talk about having a unanimity of vision and the potential short-sightedness of three ex-players looking at a situation and saying, well, what do we think A.J. De La Garza is going to bring the team from a soccer perspective? You know, I think the danger is that the LA Galaxy front office could alienate their fan base by dismissing the emotional attachment that fans have to players like AJ De La Garza. And by making decisions that though maybe there is a soccer benefit to it, I don't think that there is, but maybe there is because I don't know soccer as much as they do. Mm -hmm. But I know how uh, the fans of LA Galaxy felt about AJ De La Garza. And to risk losing a lot of fans, to risk alienating your fan base by making decisions that are perceived as sort of totally dismissing, you know, the investment that LA Galaxy fans have made in the team. Um, you know, to me, it suggests a type of concrete thinking, um, which is sort of short-sighted and which for me is worrisome. Um, some of the things that they've done, which I'm really happy about, I like, I really like the idea of us relying more on academy players because I think that the LA Galaxy has a fa fantastic account, uh, academy. Mm -hmm. And one of the major problems that I had with Bruce is that he has this terrible predilection towards always going with the older veteran player. You know, he's really a trust guy and a loyalty guy. And he would play he would much rather play someone who he's known for 10 years than take a chance on a kid who he doesn't know. And I know that Curtin Alfo, since he obviously has relationships with all the Los Dos players, is going to be much more willing to take chances with academy players. I like the idea of assigning players to mid-table leagues like Joao Pedro. I don't know if he's good, but I'm pretty sure that no one else does either since no one watches the Portuguese league. I mean, <laughs> I know. I don't know anyone. I've asked all my LA Galaxy friends. Does anyone know? No one knows. <laughs> I'm actually in favor of it. I'm not in favor of signing Jermaine Jones for $550,000. Seems like a totally irrational decision, but we'll see what he brings. I would say either Jermaine Jones is going to, you know, tear an ACL and be out for the season and the LA Galaxy will have wasted a half million dollars, or he's going to be a really big impact player and be a really positive influence. I, I don't think he's going to be a player where we say, was Jermaine Jones playing? He kind of disappeared. I don't know. I don't think that's that's not really what I think we're going to see. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, well, one name that's kind of flown under the radar a bit uh, in all of this conversation is Brian Rowe, who was called up by Bruce Arena to replace Stefan Fry for the January camp. Is that is that a promotion based on merit, do you think? Or if, say, another former MLS coach were in charge of the U.S. national team, do you think that call up maybe doesn't happen? Or is, has Rowe deserved that? Basically, I haven't seen enough of him to know one way or the other, so I'm asking your opinion. I think Brian Rowe is a solid keeper. He's a good keeper. I think that he was called up because he he's in Los Angeles and Bruce knows him. Mm -hmm. And as I said, boy, Bruce is really a trust guy. He's really a loyalty guy. He wants 
wants to go with the people that he knows. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a lot of people, including Josh, probably who would say that Brian Rowe is a great keeper and that this was entirely justified based on merit. I would say that it's fine that he's called in and he's a good keeper and, you know, let him have one camp and that's fine. <laughs> again, again, a very diplomatic answer. It's, it's, tough, it's tough to believe what you're saying about Bruce Arena. It's not like he's the guy who called in Demarcus Beasley for this camp. <laughs> if Landon Donovan was available... He would call him in. I, yeah, I feel like he probably would. And if he does, we'll have to get you back on the line. But for now, Wendy, thank you so much for taking all, all the time to, uh, to talk to me this evening. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your rainy evening in uh, Los Angeles. Thanks very much. Uh, and, oh, and before we let you go, uh, one more time with plugs. If people want to hear more from you, read more, meet, read more from you, uh, where can they find that? So I, if you enjoyed listening to me, you can certainly listen to Corner of the Galaxy, it's the LA Galaxy podcast. Uh, I also write for the website, cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm a contributor to American Soccer Now, and I'm also on Twitter at Bards Blonde. That works. All of those are very helpful links. So thank you very much, Wendy, again, and uh, enjoy your evening. Thanks.